Lonely Planet started as a book Maureen and Tony Wheeler wrote for friends on their overland trip from Europe to Australia, stapled together at their kitchen table. It included tips like selling your blood at the roadside to pay for your next bus ticket and how to hitchhike through Khyber Pass. Since then, 150 million of the travel books have been printed in 33 different languages. And the guidebooks are so diverse, there's even one called The Joy of Wild Swimming. I'm Sharon Brett Kelly. Today on The Detail, on the 50th anniversary of Lonely Planet, I talk to three Kiwi travel writers about how the sector's changed and how to get cut through when you're up against Instagram, TikTok and everything else. I'm uh, Craig McLaughlin. I'm a freelance anything, and I've been writing Lonely Planet guidebooks for the last 25 years. Can you describe where you're staying at the moment? We're in Port Douglas in a little place called the Pink Flamingo, and the room is very bright, orange and pinks. This is the sort of place where Lonely Planet writers stay. <laughs> oh, um, is it budget? Oh, it's, it's mid-range. Um, I'm I'm travelling with my wife. When I do these jobs, my wife comes with me and uh, we kind of like to have a private bathroom. So it's lower mid-range, but we always have a private bathroom. <laughs> God, yeah, you'd have to insist on a private bathroom these days, wouldn't you, after doing oh, yeah, this for yeah, 25 yeah. years? <laughs> Well, I am so I'm excited about talking to you, Craig, because you're heading up to Daintree and Cape Tribulation, and that immediately brings back memories for me, um, you know, of my real travelling days before I got married and had babies and all that kind of thing. I mean, that is such an amazing part of the world. Yeah, it's it's beautiful. Uh, you know, I was sitting over, I went out into the pool this morning, and I looked up into the trees above the pool, and all the bright coloured Australian birds sort of gawking down at me, making all sorts of funny noises. And uh, yeah, it's magnificent. You are doing research for the twenty second edition of Lonely Planet Australia. Yes. Yeah. What does that involve? It, it's sort of a bit different. I mean, I think, uh, did you used to run around with a Lonely Planet guidebook? Well, <laughs> I have to admit that our travel Bible was Let's Go, because I think that Lonely oh, Planet shock, was... Horror. I know, terrible, eh, to say that. But I think Lonely Planet back then was a bit edgy. So we had this thick, thick Bible called Let's Go, carried it in our backpacks. And as we travelled through Europe... We would tear out the sections of the book as we went through the different countries and we'd probably, you know, usually leave them at a youth hostel or pass them on to someone else. (laughs) Yeah. I used to do the uh, Europe on a shoestring guidebook for Lonely Planet and covered the Greek islands. And uh, I think I, I did that six times. So every couple of years we had to go to the Greek islands and go to 22 islands and wander around. It was a lot of fun. You know, Lonely Planet used to be all about uh, hotel listings and restaurant listings and that kind of thing, but um, it's sort of been relaunched now. It's sort of focusing more on experiences, things you can do. Yeah. Uh, because nowadays young, young people have got their phones and they do their hotel bookings online and the booking search engines like booking.com. How do you find these different experiences? Is it by talking to people? Is it by driving off the beaten track or walking off the beaten track? So I'm a Japan specialist. I've been working on those guidebooks. And Japan's a completely different ballgame for most visitors because they can't speak Japanese, they can't read. They actually need something to carry around with them that's going to help them find interesting things to do. And um, we just finished the next edition of the Japan Guidebook, and we're in Hokkaido for uh, nearly a month in June on that. And um, after talking to somebody in one of the nature centres on the Shiretoko National Park, uh, we found a great place called Sakura no Taki. This means um, Cherry Falls, that little waterfall about three metres high on the Shari River. And um, when we were there, there were just thousands and thousands of these cherry salmon, you know, trying to jump up the falls. It was, it was the most oh, incredible wow. sight. I sort of wondered whether I should put it in the guidebook because it, it mightn't be that great if suddenly, you know, lots mm. of foreign visitors turn up in rental cars. But And, you know, Japan is that sort of place where you you really need a guidebook. 
with that little waterfall, did, did you write it up? Did you put it in the book? Because that decision that you make could change that place forever. Well, possibly. It's, it's way out in the middle of nowhere in Hokkaido. Um, and you, you need a rental car to get there and you've got to make an effort. You, you know, the Japanese visitors know about it. And I ended up, um, I, I did put it in the, in, the, in the next guidebook. And just thinking back on it, I remember there's, there's a small car park there and there's a sign. And the, and the only thing it actually said in English was that bears may appear. Because it's not only tourists that like watching the salmon. There are very big brown bears in Hokkaido and they can be quite dangerous. But it, it's a magic spot out in the middle of nowhere that I, I really doubt that too many foreigners have uh, been to. Well, in, in it, it makes me want to go there. And it's funny because Japan is Japan's one of those places. It feels at the moment that that's the place that everybody wants to go to. And interestingly enough, it's one of the countries where they want you to come, or at least the government wants you to come. I mean, they're, they're trying to target international visitors as, as a way of helping the economy. You know, they were having the Olympics in uh, 2020, and their target for uh, international visitors that year was 40 million. You know, we, we target four. They're targeting 40, and then, and, and, you know, they're slightly bigger than New Zealand in the area. So, yeah, they're very keen. Well, at least the Japanese government is very keen to bring international tourists in. Quite a few of the really rural areas where they don't see too many foreigners and they're not too well prepared for them um, aren't that excited because they're worried about having to speak, you know, not being able to converse with tourists who come in or tourists struggling with menus and and not knowing Japanese customs and coming in with their shoes on on the tatami mats and Mm. all that kind of thing. So... While the government wants as many international tourists in there as possible, uh, way out in the countryside, they're not so sure. <laughs> what about the travellers that you meet, the young travellers? Are they still the same as you would have been in, in your 20s, say, doing it for the first time, doing it on the cheap? Are they still adventurous? Are they still taking risks? Oh, well, it's a whole different world, isn't it? I mean, um, when, I, when, <laughs> when I started wandering around, it was the 80s, and we didn't have internet, and we didn't have cell phones, and you still picked up mail post restaurant at post I know. Offices. So, yeah, it's a totally different world out there. I think people these days, they've, they've got everything, access to everything on their phones. But has that changed the way they travel? Oh, definitely. You know, they, they, know, what, they know what they're going to see before they see it. That they lose a bit of the adventure out of it because they know what's going to happen next. You you have to look up on your phone and see what uh, rating a restaurant has before you'll go to it, which sort of takes, to me, that takes some of the fun out of it. Sorry, I've just um, walked up some stairs. I'm going to try, I think a little bit of shade here. So I'll, okay. I'll take my spot here and catch my breath a little bit. I'm calling Peter Dragicevich while he's walking along the Coogee coastline as part of his assignment to update the Sydney chapter for the Australia Lonely Planet. It's quite a famous walking route. And then at this time of the year, actually, in two days' time, they're launching uh, sculptures by the sea. And then it gets really crazily busy. So I thought I'd get in early before it got too crazy. And they're just setting some stuff up. Because it is iconic. But what makes it so special, that walk? Oh, the the crashing surf on these kind of amazing jagged cliffs along the way, and it's broken up by about four major beaches, uh, starting off with Bondi, then Tamarama, Bronte, and then ending in Coogee. And along the way, there's also Cla Valley, which is like a a sea inlet where there's really great snorkeling and um, great for swimming too. And Peter, how long have you been travel writing for? Uh, I started with Lonely Planet. My first assignment was in January 2006. Uh, and before that, I used to work and do a little bit of travel stuff in uh, newspapers and magazines as well. 17 years later, do you still get the same thrill from writing about your travels as you did back then? Yeah, absolutely. And every so often, uh, Lonely Planet might send me somewhere I've never been before, which is great. But this is Sydney assignment I'm really excited by because I used to live here. I've got lots of good friends and I've got family here. And um, and just reconnecting and seeing how things have changed and... Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of nice to sort of check in on it. But really, what's changed about it? I feel like Sydney's got a real um, vibe to it at the moment. All of the big public institutions are better, like the Australian Museum. Art Gallery of New South Wales had a major extension. 
the powerhouse museum has rearranged all of their displays and it's just you know it's nice to be in a city where there's it feels like you know there's money being spent on that kind of thing there was a lot of talk over covid with travel and worries about over tourism and and many places around the world that you know we do things differently have things changed in terms of how people travel and the places they go to uh, I had hopes that things might improve somewhat um, because, I, you know, tourism had really been hammering some of the places I do write about and care about. And I, you know, I sort of really hoped if anything good had come from COVID that maybe we wouldn't get the cruise ships back. Um, but that seems to have automatically changed around and people are very enthusiastic about cruise ships coming back into um, some ports. But of course, the people of Dubrovnik and Venice and Kotor are probably less enthusiastic. I don't know. I feel like it's just going to all explode again, to be honest, and there may not be too much done better, which is disappointing, really. And so, as a travel writer, where the aim is to, you know, encourage people to travel, how do you feel about that? Well, I think what we encourage and what we what we speak to is people that want to do it independent travel and actually get under the skin of a place and actually understand a little bit about the place. Um, it's not just about ticking off a list of sites like, you know, um, you know, a lot of the Instagram kind of travel tends to be. So I, I, I like to think that there's still a force for good in travel, but it's to be had by people that actually want to make that effort to engage. It's not, it's not to be had from sitting on a boat and then doing a day trip organized by the tour company and then going back onto your boat again. Um, it you know I know, I know a lot of people love that kind of travel and I get that it's really convenient especially for people with mobility issues or maybe a bit elderly or have other is- issues that make it hard for them to get around in which case it can be the only way to get around a lot of these places but I, I I don't think it's really giving you a real sense of the place and and I think any Lonely Planet rider will tell you the worst time to be in any of those small towns in the Mediterranean is when the boat comes in. <laughs> So there are aspects of travel that I, I think that um, that have changed that are not for the better. And I'd like to think that we provide a way that people can really actually still have that engagement with a culture and a place and a history and a, and all of those things that make um, the world unique and open your eyes to different ways of thinking. It's easy to sort of be critical of, I guess, young travellers today that they're obsessed with Instagram and getting their ideas from TikTok and all of that kind of thing. But are they still the same, really, young travellers, as when you first started writing about travel? Yeah, look, I think it's actually a wonderful thing, you know, young people travelling. I I was really disappointed, actually, when we were talking about reimagining tourism during COVID, and the Minister of Tourism was quite dismissive of uh, what what was described as low-value tourists. But I think backpack to culture is actually, you know, actually one of the the healthier things about travel in some ways, and that the young people that are doing that kind of thing are immersing themselves in places. They usually stay longer. They quite often get jobs working in bars and you know restaurants, and actually and get to know locals and and you know and actually spend their money out in bars and you know and most of what they earn they'll spend. And I think it's uh, to dismiss it as being low value was disappointing to me. Um, you know, I think there's more value to having those kind of people from all over the world, say, come to New Zealand um, and have that experience and go away with a positive view of New Zealand, a bit of an understanding of what makes us tick, uh, than it is to get super rich people jetting in and staying in a luxury lodge and really not doing anything but flying by helicopter to do, you know, some skiing or something. Um, that, to me, seems to have far less, you know, value to the country in the long run. <laughs> You know, before COVID, I think we had the best hostel scene in the world that I've been to. You know, we had really wonderful places that um, you could stay in quite a lot of comfort, even as now I'm an older traveller. Um, but there's that sense of energy that comes with those young tourists that come through. And I would like to think the Lonely Planet readers are people that do want to delve into what makes this place tick, what makes it work, what makes it special, and try and learning about people and culture and different ways of doing things. One thing I have noticed is that um, the internet hasn't necessarily been a great thing for hostels in terms of people, you know, talking and hanging out. There was a time, I would say, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 years ago, when you go to a hostel and people would be sitting around and chatting and, you know, maybe watching the communal TV or having a barbecue. And now you you look around and a lot of people are just on their devices, um, which is disappointing. 
the last one I stayed in would, would have been in Queenstown, and um, and I, you know, right in the heart of Queenstown, you know, great place to stay, and you know they do have events, so you can you know join the barbecue and what have you, and be the the weird old guy in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> Do you worry about bed bugs? I have at times been quite paranoid about it, um, but I have to say I've been pretty lucky. I'm all my, <laughs> all my travels so far. I'm trying to reach out and touch some wood as I'm speaking. Um, yeah, I've never had a problem with them. And I've stayed in hostels and hotels and all over the place. So Lonely Planets had a long journey from that first manuscript that Tony Wheeler bashed out on a typewriter, and the book's a lot safer these days, less edgy. The Wheelers sold it several years ago, but New Zealand Herald travel writer Thomas Bywater says their legacy lives on. It's a very um, Jack Kerouac, isn't it? But yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a long way from that, uh, what is now sort of Lonely Planet Online, they're sort of one of the, the largest travel websites, which I guess is where lots of the eyeballs are nowadays, or the little blue books which sort of popped up in the at the end of the 80s, which mm. um, I guess were, you know, perfect pocket size for you to, to wander around, you know, Anchor Wat and uh, all of these all of these places which, you know, had really been roughing it and I guess by then had, had become really part of the the tourist trail through, through Southeast Asia. So, mm. yeah, it's I guess it's been a journey for the book. The way you would pick up a Lonely Planet guide nowadays, it isn't the cover to cover, you know, this is your your guide, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. You start at one end of, of Australia and uh, six months later you're you're ending up in, in Greece or, or whichever way yeah, around you do it's it. It's not it's, like a big fat Bible, is it? It isn't the big Bible. fat Bible. It's become a reference book. And yeah. I guess that's the way we travel now. You know, you dip in and out of it in the same way that the other end of a you know, budget airplane ticket, you know, a lot of the places, Bali, which I guess would have been very exotic in the, the late 70s, um, you know, definitely didn't have a, a seasonal flight out of Auckland. So, no. um, so where yeah. is exotic these days? I was reading the other day in The Guardian Traveller about the border between Norway and Russia, how, oh, that, yeah. how that's become sort of a destination for very adventurous travellers who just want to go there and look across the water to Russia just to see Out what to it's Karelia, like. Yes, absolutely. All of these sort of bits of Finland and going back to the point that there are a lot of places in, you know, what was across Asia on the cheap and the the early lonely planet, which, you know, even with a with a travel guide in your in your pocket, they're, they're almost kind of no go places. I, I know that the wheelers love their time in Afghanistan, and I think there are a lot of places which were no go and probably are still no go in the minds of some of the the readers who would have been doing their the OE in the in the eighties and and seventies. Yeah, in terms of you know lonely planet and cut through these days, I mean it's up against a lot, isn't it? It's up against things like TripAdvisor, even Facebook, where people share their experiences, or Instagram or TikTok. I mean, my nephew is in South America right now, and he's writing about his travels on Substack. So I just wonder, has Lonely Planet done a good job of of kind of keeping itself out there? I think it has, and and definitely with a, a certain generation of of traveller. I was in in the Cook Islands in in Atataki, uh, not that long ago, and they've seen a huge sort of influx of, of visitors recently. You know, they've just got their Hawaiian airline links with you know more more direct links out from the other side of the the Pacific, and the amount of people who I stopped and talked to and said they were there in Atataki to see. Tony Wheeler's favourite lagoon. They were saying, you know, they'd seen Tahiti and Bora Bora, but they wanted to see the Cook Islands because it had been in the Lonely Planet. That means a lot to a certain generation of traveller who's who's grown up with the guides, as we've been saying earlier. Mm. But yeah, there is there's a lot of places you can get your information nowadays, and the Lonely Planet sort of came about because they were writing up about places that other guidebooks didn't go because there wasn't a market there uh, and that wasn't necessarily what they were were following. They were so, so adventurous, weren't they, the wheelers? They were very adventurous and just, you know, I get the feeling from some of the contributors to The Lonely Planet that, um, you know, there was a real sort of gear change in the early 2000s when, you know, it became less of a, 
an overlander's bible and more of a you know established uh publishing business that you know the books which got written were probably following the travelers rather than the travelers following where is the next exciting place which i think isn't necessarily the the job of the lonely planet anymore or, or you know who who they're writing for mm. it is you know the the people who've set up a sub sub stack or a YouTube channel. There's amazing sort of um, adventures of people who are sort of hopping on box cars and riding trains from Dakar through to Djibouti through Central Africa, and places that yeah would be very difficult to get travel insurance nowadays. But who knows? You know, another fifty years, maybe there will be the next Dubrovnik or, or Dalmatian coast. You know, if the the reviews of the the local steam train museum and the Lonely Planet isn't doing it for you, then you know you can follow these people who are way more Tony and more in wheelers out there today. That adventure is out there. Whether it's in the pages of the Lonely Planet anymore, um, maybe not. That's it for today. I'm Sharon Brett-Kelly. The detail is supported by the Public Interest Journalism Fund. Today's episode was engineered by William Saunders. Our producers are Alexia Russell and Bonnie Harrison. And thanks to Thomas Bywater, Craig McLaughlin and Peter Dragicevich. Kakite anō. Ka